Uh, thank you, Peter and PK, for the invitation to come up here and talk. It's always a pleasure. Uh, it's a very complex topic. I'll try and make it uh, as easy as uh, possible. I don't have any disclosures. Uh, so when we're talking about dissection, it usually occurs within the medial layer of the aortic wall. A couple of the terms that I'm going to be using throughout the case just so that people understand, uh, when I talk about true lumen, it's actually going to be the lumen within uh, that's enclosed by all four layers, all three layers of the, of the artery. So this is where the blood is really supposed to be. And when we talk about the false lumen, this is where the blood is really not supposed to be, and that's, this is all the uh, dissected area. Uh, there's some other um, things that you need to know about. If it's a type A dissection, it usually involves an ascending aorta, and that's usually an open cardiac emergency as of now. I think there might be technology later on uh, that may help treat this endovascularly, but as of now, it is a uh, open surgical uh, em emergency. And whenever, whenever we're talking about a type B dissection, the ascending is not involved. Uh, there are some time frames we actually look at. Uh, you know, when we talk about uh, treating them, we usually talk about treating them within the acute and subacute phase. I'm not going to go into uh, the chronic phase, so we usually get them between the first 14 days or, or within 14 days to uh, three months. And they can be complicated aortic dissections, which warrant treatment, or they can be uncomplicated aortic dissections, and, and uh, we'll talk about what the indications for treatment uh, for those are. Uh, this is just a schematic diagram showing you what a type A dissection is. So if there's any involvement of the ascending portion of the aorta, uh, which is right here, it's classified as a type A. So it could extend all the way down, but this would still be a type A uh, uh, dissection, and, and the type B would be really fo uh, localized to distal to the left subclavian artery. The incidence is about 10 to 12 per 100,000 uh, patient year. Uh, like I said, they could be uncomplicated or they could be complicated, and the complicated ones uh, usually have some sort of end organ uh, malperfusion. This could be intestinal ischemia, it could be renal failure, it also could be uh, ischemia of the lower e extremities, and those really have to be treated as they are uh, emergent. Uh, the end organ ischemia happens because you may have either a dynamic obstruction uh, or you may have a static obstruction. As this false lumen moves back and forth, or the intima moves back and forth, it can kind of uh, create, an, create an obstruction uh, event at the origin or at the ostium of, of one of the vessels, and this can lead to kind of waxing and waning symptoms, or, or it could be a more static fixed uh, problem. Uh, there, there are a few indications that I said are really absolute indications for, uh, for treating them. Some of the um, some of the indications for treating uncomplicated uh, dissections are the one that's listed further down. And I think we've had, we have many studies that really show you that if you have a total aortic diameter of greater than 40 millimeters uh, just at the, at the distal uh, arch, uh, that may be an indication for a treatment. And if you have a patent false lumen uh, greater than 22 millimeters, that also may be an uh, indication. And having a large one centimeter proximal tear uh, can also be an indication for uh, treatment. So what is the goal of actually treating this? So what we really want to do is we want to cover the entry tear. Uh, we want to prevent rupture. We really want to reestablish the true lumen and help in aortic remodeling, and that's usually our, our end goal. Unfortunately, there are some disadvantages to, to offering uh, uh, endovascular treatment for type B. Uh, you can have a type A dissection. Uh, uh, and that could be, uh, be life-threatening. You could also uh, develop spinal cord ischemia, which, uh, uh, which the coded risk is about 10 to 15 percent, and it all depends on the amount of aorta that you end up uh, covering. We have some pretty good data from the INSTED XL trial. Uh, they had 140 patients that had stable, so this is uh, uncomplicated uh, uh, type B dissections. They were randomized to uh, getting a TVAR plus optimal medical th uh, therapy uh, versus uh, optical medical therapy alone. And looking at the five-year data, uh, up the two-year data really didn't show too much of a uh, difference, but the five-year data showed that the aortic-related mortality was actually uh, statistically significant at 6.9 for uh, the TVAR plus OMT versus 16.9% uh, for the patients that only had uh, medical therapy, and the, dis and the disease progression was actually more for patients that had only medical therapy. Uh, so this, this data kind of supported uh, offering endovascular repair because most of these patients were just managed with, with optical uh, medical therapy alone. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a few steps of the, of the uh, procedure. It usually involves a, a TVAR. We usually cover the left subclavian artery. It may or may not be revascularized depending on the kind of practice you have. And we usually try to, to seal up any large uh, tears that we may come across uh, 
uh, further downstream. So the renals, the, the iliacs. We don't really want to do an extensive aortic coverage to prevent the risk of spinal cord ischemia. Uh, there are a fair number of thoracic devices that are available. Gore and Medtronic have FDA indications for uh, dissection. Cook and Bolton at this point do not have uh, an FDA indication to, uh, to look at dissection or to treat dissection. I'm going to skip through the slide. just gives you the, the various uh, uh, properties of, of the different kind of graphs that you have. Uh, these are relatively large profile devices, so you need to have good access. Uh, most of them are done by standard common femoral artery approach, and in our practice, we actually do uh, percutaneous access for uh, almost all of them. Uh, alternative, alternatively, you can also go retroperitoneal, and you can also put in a, a, a conduit if you need to, or you can also do what's called an endovascular uh, conduit, which, uh, which Dr. Marin is a, uh, used to be a big fan of. Uh, when we place in a stent graft, we usually talk about what zone we're placing the graft in. Uh, for dissections, we usually place the graft in zone two. You want to cover the left sub left subclavian. Uh, for aneurysm disease, we may go up to zone one and zone uh, uh, one, I'm sorry, zone one and zone zero, and we would have to debranch all those vessels. Uh, the reason you want to cover the left subclavian is because we have enough data that shows that. Uh, uh, that the tear is usually right at the left subclavian artery. There's, a, there's a, a maximum point of stress at that location. So if you don't cover that tear, uh, you know, you're, not, you're not really treating it, and, and you could propagate a type A dissection at that point. So it's, so it's quite important to cover the left subclavian artery. Uh, these are pictures that show you a zone two deployment. This is pretty standard for uh, when we're doing TVARs for dissection, and zone one and zero are really more appropriately applied for patients that have aneurysmal disease. Uh, I talked about covering the left subclavian artery. Uh, everyone's a little bit different as to how they manage it. Uh, if I have a uh, semi-elective case, I'll always revascularize the left subclavian first because it actually uh, helps reduce the incidence of spinal cord uh, ischemia. There are some absolute indications where you have to cover, where you have to revascularize the left. Uh, subclavian, and I think one of them would be if you have a Lima by, uh, a bypass graft, you, you cannot just cover that up. But uh, a, a lot of programs will do selective revascularization. They'll, they'll go ahead and cover the left subclavian, and if the patient's symptomatic, they may get a, a, a bypass later on. Let me show you a quick case. It's a 71-year-old female. Uh, she presents with chest and back pain. She did not improve with, with, with blood pressure control. Uh, she underwent a CTA. You can see over here the, the true lumen is really pancaked down. I'm just going to put my pointer on it, and this is the true lumen right here. The right, the right renal is coming off the, uh, the false lumen, and here is the, uh, here is the false lumen. Uh, I think using an, inter, uh, an IVIS is essential in every single dissection case. Uh, if, you're, if you're treating dissections and you're not using IVIS, that would be a big mistake uh, because you want to make sure that your wires are uh, in the true lumen and you're not stenting open the false lumen, which would uh, really probably lead to a mortality uh, instantaneously. We also use an IVIS to measure our aortic diameters since you really don't want to be aggressive in oversizing or, or doing any sort of uh, adjunct procedure like balloon angioplasty. So here you see the, the stent graft is placed up, uh, up and, the, and the subclavian artery has been covered. Uh, this shows you an intravascular ultrasound. So just to give you an orientation, this is the true lumen right here, which has kind of been, kind of been pancaked, and that was actually post-stent deployment. And now you can see that the, that the, true, that the true lumen has opened up nicely. Uh, this is just another patient, just showing you uh, how it looks when you're actually looking at it live. On the, uh, on the left is, is pre-stent, and, and you can see that there's a fair amount of collapse of the, of the true lumen. And this is, this is what causes the, uh, the dynamic obstruction. It's, uh, it basically obstructs the, the ostium. And this was a, uh, this is the, the picture that was, this, this is the IVIS that was done after the stent deployment, and you can see that the, that the true lumen is, uh, is much more open, and there's less compression near those osteal vessels. Uh, and um, the, as, I, as I mentioned before, the right renal was coming off the false lumen, so we went ahead and, and uh, stented that, and there was probably a fenestration there, so a covered stent would, uh, would help us in the, in the long term. This is our usual protocol. If you have a type E dissection, if you, have a, if you come in with a complicated dissection, you get a TVAR plus minus whatever adjunct procedure you may need. If you have an uncomplicated uh, type B dissection, we look at you as to how old you are, what kind of comorbid uh, factors do you have, and if, you, if, you're, if you're older and you have uh, a lot of significant comorbid conditions, we'll really manage you medically. But if you're a low-risk, uh, healthy patient and you have high-risk factors on CTA, uh, you, we, we would actually offer you a TVAR and uh, adjunct. So to conclude, um, you know, TVAR plus optimum medical therapy is as associated with improved five-year aortic specific survival and delayed uh, disease progression. 
And in stable type B aortic dissection with suitable anatomy and high risk factors on imaging, you could consider doing a preemptive uh, TVAR to improve long-term outcome. Thank you.